it's time for Coffee with the Chicken Ladies, a podcast for people who love chickens. Hey, everybody, and welcome. It's Chrissy and Holly from Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We're here, and this is episode number 146 of our podcast, where we talk about everything chicken, family, fun, and more chickens. More chickens. We drink a ton of coffee. I'm talking a ton. But most importantly, we hug chickens every day. And we kiss them too. Don't forget, we brew coffee from a little coffee house in historic Gettysburg, PA, Phantom Coffee Roasters. Holly, and what kind of coffee are we brewing today? Dark and delicious French roast. It's so yummy. And it's iced. We made it iced today because let me tell you something, it's hot. Mm -hmm. So where can everybody get this coffee? Phantomroasters.com. And follow them on social media. Are you ready to sip some of this delicious iced coffee and chat? I am. But first, a word from our sponsor. We have some exciting news to share from our sponsor, Grubly Farms. They're here, new and improved, Grubly's World Harvest. I'm a longtime subscriber, and my flock love the healthy, nutritious treats, plus orders $40 or more ship free. If you haven't heard, Grubly's has a fantastic layer pellet and crumble feed. It's packed with plant and insect protein, perfect for those picky chickens and ducks. Grubly Farms makes food and treats for healthy pets and planet. To support us and Grubly's, go to our website or our show notes and use the link. Try it today. So how are you doing today in midst of this major heat wave we're in in the mid-Atlantic? I am melting, and I'm not even kidding. As you're fanning yourself, as I see you on the screen. It's hot as blazes. Now, everybody, we're recording via Zoom today because we're both on our own farm today because the heat is going to be about 100 degrees. So we want to be with our animals and make sure that we're taking care of them in the heat and getting them through. I posted on Facebook a link to our article. We do have an article out there that talks about tips and tricks that we do during the season of heat. Right. It's also an episode, episode 137. So earlier this summer, we recorded that. And yeah, if you don't feel like listening, the article's right there on our website under the articles tab. Right. It's a good place if you're kind of like, what? I need some new ideas to go check it out. Or even some refreshers. I mean, if you thought that summer was over like the rest of us and you've forgotten. Yeah. Summer is not over. It's like the Mid-Atlantic always has like all the full summer, Indian summer, all these different summers. Not and like this, though. Not it's like bad. this. this it's 100 bad. degrees. 100 degrees. And yeah. You know, it's supposed to be 80. So it's really high. 75 by this point. I know. It's craziness. The other thing I wanted to talk about was I wanted to give a big thank you to everyone who purchased those hens that Holly Ann made and we put on Etsy. It was fast. They sold out rapidly. Less than 24 (laughs) hours. Less than 24 hours. But she put a lot of hard work into those. And, you know, it was just so nice to see. It was a great way that you can support us. And, you know, I just love them. They're so cute. Now there's going to be more on. Yes. We're going to try to get them on periodically. And when we do, we'll announce it on social media. Right. I'm over here stitching. Stitch faster, stitch faster. Stitch faster, right. In between all the other things. Yeah, that's right. Go put some ice water outside, then come back and do a few stitches, then come back in. I actually have been doing more the past two days just because of the heat. So yeah, I'll go out, fresh water, watermelon, something like that, come back in, stitch on a chicken or whatever else. My Um, babies are loving the watermelon. Oh, shoot. That's cute. Now the sheep will go on my Baltimore Wool Company Etsy shop, but yeah, I'm doing some sheep. Yeah, even the babies are enjoying the watermelon right now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Never too young to enjoy a little bit of watermelon in the heat. Absolutely not. Well, you know what? That's what I'm going to do when we finish recording. I'm going to finish up in the barn, and I'm going to go buy a bunch of watermelon and cantaloupe. Thank you for giving me my afternoon plans. The crazy chicken lady with like 10 watermelons in a cart in the store. It's it's going to happen. (laughs) That's going to happen. Oh, you know what else we should mention before we actually start getting into this show? Stop being so giddy, Chris. We are going I'm not to gonna be, stop laughing. I'm never gonna stop laughing, man. I can't I'd be I'd be seriously worried if you did. We're <laughs> going to be giving a talk at a local farm in Hartford County, Maryland, Purple the Pur- Rain Lavender Farm. The Purple Rain Lavender Farm in Churchville, Maryland is one of my favorite places to visit. And we're gonna be there. Is it a sign up, Chris? I believe it's going to be a sign up. Look on their social media page to see, but it's well, sub- if September sixteenth. Saturday, September 16th in the afternoon. If I can find it, I will link it 
in the show notes in case there are some spots open and you want to come out and meet us and listen to our talk. Yeah, if you're a local peep, come on out and join us at the Lavender Farm. We're going to be talking beginning a chicken flock and what to do. It's going to be lots of fun. And the Lavender Farm is just absolutely beautiful. Okay, so on that note, if you're listening to our show and you're loving it, head on over to Apple Podcast and leave us a written review. It does amazing things for the growth of our show. And while you're there, hit that subscribe button that way for two reasons. You never miss an episode, and it's another really easy way to help the podcast grow. If you're looking for other ways to help the show, you can share your favorite episodes on social media. You can tell some chicken-loving friends about the podcast. Two million. You can check out our Etsy shop where we have mugs, t-shirts, and hopefully more little chickens soon. You can become a patron of the show, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. A gigantic thank you to all of our patrons. You really make this podcast happen. Love those lovely ladies. Love them. And the other thing you can do to help support the podcast is visit our website or our show notes, use our affiliate links and discount codes, and buy products from our sponsors. Hey, Chris. Yeah. Do you like subscription boxes? Does it have anything to do with chickens? Of course. Then yeah. Let me take a minute to tell you about the chicken love box. If you love goodies for your chickens and you, you need to go to chickenlove.com. I love the mega box. Tons of useful products for my flock and a chicken tea for me. You can't go wrong with a chicken tea. They are so cute and so soft. In the August box, I absolutely love those amazingly good smelling nest box herbs and that giant roll of rooster stickers. They're great. I love the wood decorative plate. It's going up in our studio today. And with all my baking, those egg separators are going to work awesomely. Boxes start at $39 a month. They ship immediately after your order and shipping is always free. Such a great deal. Don't wait. Get off the nest and click already. Use the code CWTCL50 for 50% off your first box of a three-month subscription or more. That's chickenlove.com. That's chickenluv.com. Get your subscription today. Have you heard of Strong Animals Chicken Essentials? They make natural supplements for your flock. Strong Animals has used plant-based products and natural approaches to promote the health and vitality of backyard flocks. Their products contain organic essential oils, prebiotics, and other natural ingredients to support the immune system and digestive health. Give your chicks and chickens what they need to thrive with Strong Animals Health Products. Visit GetStrongAnimals.com today. The Breed Spotlight is brought to you by Murray McMurray Hatchery, defining quality for generations. For over a century, Murray McMurray Hatchery has remained a trusted family-owned business working tirelessly to ensure our poultry meet the highest standards. Whether you are an experienced enthusiast or just embarking on the journey, look to McMurray Hatchery for guaranteed quality rare and heritage breeds, low minimums, and all the supplies you need to raise your flock. Request a free catalog today. Ding, ding, dong, dong, ding, ding, dong, time <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This week's breed spotlight is... The Shamo. And it's a listener request. We've had some requests. We are doing the Shamo. Now, the Shamo is quite an exciting chicken. Yeah, they're interesting birds. The Shamo is a rare breed chicken from Japan. They're one of the tall, melee-like breeds that historically have been used for fighting. Though, they're also found in poultry show circles. And they have a reputation for being surprisingly friendly with people. Right. So, you know... They can be really the best of both worlds, you know? They're and friendly. I thought, was, I thought that was interesting because the Indigo Gigante also has Shamo in them. And again, they're friendly with people. That's awesome for this breed. So right. they are found in the APA's Oriental class and are currently listed in the critically endangered. So they're going to need some help. So the Livestock Conservancy has them critically endangered. So this breed does need some assistance. So if you can help, please do. <laughs> the Shamo arrived in Japan by way of Thailand, but they were probably from India and Pakistan before that. The Livestock Conservancy notes that the Shamo is a strain of the Azil, and that is another game-like breed that is from the India-Pakistan region. Right, and you don't see a lot of breeds from that area. You don't see a ton of breeds. 
The Livestock Conservancy also notes that the word shamo is a corruption of Siam, which is the old word for Thailand. Think Siamese cats. Yep. Shamo first came into Japan during the 1600s. And the Japanese breeders took great care in selecting and breeding them into a unique variety. They're actually protected by law in Japan to save them from extinction. They're considered national monuments. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, shamo is a Japanese term that it essentially means game bird. Right. We were looking at this the other day when we were... Right. And the term applies to seven different types of chickens. Uh, some of them are from different regions, but they, have, they each have their own characteristics. So we'll name them. We're going to use their English names. And if we slaughter things, uh, apologies in advance to our listeners in Japan. Okay, so I'll start. Oh, Shamo, which That's is Jap Japanese large game. The Koshamo, which is the Japanese small game, what we would call bantam. Okay, so here I go. I'm not good at pronouncing these, but it's the Yamato Ganuki, the Yamato game bird. The Yakido, which is the my game bird. Okay, so we have the Kimpa, which is the Japanese henny feathered game. Yeah, and just like the name says, they are hen feathered. Yes. There's also the Nankin Shamo, the Japanese slender game bird. I have not found if they actually have any relation to our Nankins or not. But okay, they so are we, a smaller bird. They might have some relation. Who knows? Ikichiko. <laughs> Ichiko. Ichigo. Ichigo Nankin Shamo. That is the Nagato Slender game. Here in the U.S., we do not have all of these wonderful distinctions. We have large fell shamo and bantam shamo. That makes it so much easier. <laughs> I guess it does. I mean, I'm sure there are fascinating and wonderful things about all of those varieties. I would love to see a bantam shamo. That bird would be you so know what? cute. They're very cute. They are. I looked at them. They're very cute. Yeah. I yeah. mean, do you still so, have long legs for a bantam at that point? They do. They do. And actually, you'll probably see them when we go to the Ohio Nationals. I can't wait. I know. So how did the Shamo end up in the U.S.? How? People's best guess, and by people, I mean, you know, poultry historians, etc. Their best guess is that soldiers returning from World War II probably brought Shamos back with them, especially soldiers from the U.S. South who wanted to breed Shamos into their fighting birds oh. because it Cockfighting was much more of a thing in the South longer than in the North, although... It needs to be abolished forever. That's all is, I'm well, saying. It is. We'll talk about it a little more as we go on. Enough of the Shamos that made their way here were kept as purebred. They weren't all inbred to other fighting birds. So the worst thing they were kept as purebred, enough that the breed was accepted by the American Poultry Association in 1981 in three colors. Okay, let's talk. Black. The black breasted red. And dark. And the standard of perfection notes that this variety has a similar coloring as the dark Cornish. It's very pretty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In 1996, the Wheaton was accepted, but it was accepted in female only. Now, I'm pretty sure that the male has also been accepted since then. And okay. it should appear in the 45th printing of the standard of perfection that is out this fall. Nice. So the Shamos are pretty tall birds. As we can all see, I have a Beautiful shamo up on my screen right now because I need to be inspired to talk about this beautiful bird. <laughs> and they're pretty tall. They can go up to 30 inches, which is almost three feet. That's, I mean, I'm only five foot one. A shamo is going to be pretty tall next to me. It really would. So they're not quite as tall as the melee or the indigo gigante, but they're heading there. I need to stand next to one of these bigger birds and take a picture because again, again it would be hilarious. Ohio Nationals. <laughs> So again, they have the hard feathering. We've been talking about this a little bit in our last few breed spotlights, which means they don't have the under feathering. Now, yeah, no wait, fluff. They have no fluff. So they're again a warm weather bird. The feathering also sits tightly against their body, which I think makes them more heat hardy. Right. They need to be in a heated environment like the South or someplace because they're not going to tolerate the cold very well. Right. The APA notes in the standard of perfection that the Shamo's feathers barely cover them and they show a lot of skin. Another point to show that they are going to be more of a heat hardy bird. You're probably going to have to do some 
protection of the skin without the feathers going over it because we don't want them to sunburn. That's for sure. Mm-hmm. And their bodies, like we said, they're quite vertical. But they do have, and I don't really like using this word, but it is a meaty frame. And they're sometimes used as table birds. Though almost everything I read said that they didn't taste good, so most people don't bother. Good. Right? Good. Yay for them. (laughs) (laughs) So let's look at the size. The roosters are going to weigh in at 10 to 11 pounds and the hens around 6 to 7 pounds. They're in that same kind of category as the Indio gigante you know they're a little smaller Mm -hmm. the melee size they're all kind of in that same breed and they all kind of look alike too so right now the shamu's face is red without much feathering and the facial expression sometimes looks a little grumpy but sometimes grumpy's cute i think it's cute it looks like they're glaring at you all the time it does people people will level that at brahmas too because brahmas have the melee skull yeah i think it's really cute you know i I like these chickens. I really do. Yeah. Part of their dewlap and their throat is going to be naked. So that's part of the area that's not going to have feathering. But the way that it is, sometimes they may shield themselves from the sun there with their head. So that might help with that. And, you know, they do have a pea comb. And this is, again, the muscular yellow legs. (laughs) I mean, they're tall and muscular. They're another supermodel of the chicken world. Yeah, they are. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing. They have small red earlobes. So they're big in some spots and not in the others. They also have no pasta. Virtually no waddles. If you do not know what we're talking about, (laughs) just head back and listen to the Indio Gigante episode. So again, waddles, you would think if they need to keep cool in the heat that they would need some waddle, but they don't have it. Well, they have a lot of red skin. You know, that dewlap and throat might give off some heat. But I think the bigger thing there is waddles are not good on a fighting bird. Oh, yes. That's probably part of the reason they've been bred out. Right. Now, their wings are high and short. And now if you can imagine that. Mm -hmm. They're high in the body, but short. So, you know, they're not going to be great flyers with short wings. I don't think they're going to fly at all. No. (laughs) The wings are pretty noticeable because their feathering is so sparse. You can really see them. You know how wings kind of blend in on most Exactly. Yeah. You can really see them on these tall, muscly birds. Yeah. And I mean, they're just gorgeous birds. The tall, their tail is moderately long. It sort of like droops down behind them, if you can imagine that. Mm Mm-hmm. They're really interesting birds. They're extremely dino. This is a very dino bird. We've been doing a lot of breed spotlight of the dino birds because a lot of people are really getting into these breeds and for the right reasons right now. So I like that. We're getting out of what this bird historically was bred to fight, which should be abolished, should never happen. But it happened. Historically, it happened. So we have to move away from it and get better. And that's what we're doing. We're looking at this bird in a different way. And hopefully getting them out of the endangered, you know, category. We don't want them there. Okay. So hens lay about 90 to 100 light brown eggs per year. Not great. But apparently they're one of the better layers in this particular game bird class. So, you know, it's not too bad. They're one of the better layers. This is a heavy hen without fluff. So crush injuries are possible. Mm, Yeah. This hen is one that may go broody. So even without the fluff, they're a heavy build. So you have to be really careful with crush injuries. So it may be, you know, they sit and hatch and then you separate at that point until, you know, but keep in mind, they're big without the fluff. Yeah, they're big, non-fluffy hens. Yeah. I would imagine maybe keeping her clutch on the smaller side might help. Right. Exactly. Now, cockfighting, just a reminder. Cockfighting is illegal in all 50 states, and it's a felony in 42 states plus the District of Columbia. So this bird needs some other jobs. It does. And I would come see these people. I make them go all jail if they're fighting these birds. Go to jail, directly to jail. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Do not collect $200. Seriously. It's heinous. I mean, no one who's, we're preaching to the choir. No one who's listening to us is going to be fighting birds, I hope. So, yeah. Again, they are friendly with people. I would never leave them unattended with kids, though. 
I feel that especially with roosters and I feel that way with any bird, but especially a big, strong bird like this. Oh, yeah. They could do some damage if they wanted to. So, Mm -hmm. you know, they do have a reputation of being very good with people. But again, every individual chicken is an individual. So you never know what they're going to be like. And with the bird being 30 inches tall, children are somewhat shorter. I mean, can you imagine that? You know, a small child is going to be shorter than this this chicken. Yeah, that, that would give me nightmares, honestly. Roosters have the reputation of being extremely aggressive with each other. So they should not be kept together. Like a lot of breeders were saying they separate them as chicks. As soon as they, oh, yeah. can, you know, as soon as they can tell they have two boys, they're separated. I have also read that roosters can attack other animals that they perceive to be in their territory. They're like really good guard roosters. Hens can also be territorial, especially with small hens or gentle hens from laid back breeds. That being said, I know one of our listeners and patrons. I've seen photos of her chamosette with Brahmas. So again, this might just have to do with how you've introduced them, your setup and all of those things. Exactly. Because sometimes the bloodlines and the genetics are part of it. And other parts of it are how they're treated. So we can kind of teach them to be kinder in a way. It doesn't always work, but sometimes it does. We can kind of get them out of those behaviors by teaching them new ones, even though it's genetically bred into them. We know that chamos are very popular with a small pool of the show community. This is also a dual purpose bird, but with that reportedly tough meat and only a couple of eggs laid per week, not everyone agrees. But again, it comes down to what you're looking for. If you're not trying to feed a family of 15, you know, three or four chamo hens, maybe three or four other breeds could be more than enough for your family. Again, this would be the talk of my neighborhood. The talk of my yeah. neighborhood. They might not be the best homestead breed in the traditional sense, but I really think they have a lot of merit. Apparently, and this doesn't surprise me, they do not do well in close confinement. They don't always do well in a mixed flock. But again, there are exceptions to that. I 100% agree. I mean, you can see this across the board. They're not going to do well being confined. Shamos are not what we would call a beginner's chicken, though. Though, they probably could be if they were your only breed and all the roosters were kept separate. And I would say if you're a bit animal savvy too. Yeah, exactly. This is a chicken that you're going to have to really work hard with, get them to know you and trust you. And like you said, if you don't have roosters and you only have hens, or if you just have one rooster, that's the way to go. So you're going to have to do a lot of research in keeping the shamo for sure. Exactly. And again, our patron, Jessica, thank you, Jessica, for the suggestion, because the shamo has been fascinating. Our patron, Jessica, I've seen her free range hers together. So, I mean, it is possible to work well with this chicken. Now, again, they are not the cold hardiest of birds. They're definitely better in a warmer climate. If you have them in a colder environment, they will need heaters. That is 100% for sure. They will need them. They're big muscular birds, but they don't have much in the way of insulation. And physiologically speaking, muscle gets cold faster. Oh, yeah. Just to reiterate, they may not be the best around small children and other animals. They do have a very positive reputation for friendliness with humans. Again, and two, the showing some of the skin without being fully feathered is another reason why they will need a heater. Now, here's one of the reasons this bird is critically endangered. It's really hard to find them. Again, availability. I say it all the time. Yep. This is what makes these chickens go extinct is you can't get them anywhere. So let's talk about where we can get the chamo. Where should you go if you want to look up this bird? And I suggest as we're doing the breed spotlight, you look it up and you look up all the things about it and see if it's something that you would like. There are a few different chamo breeders clubs on Facebook. Some of them are international. Some of them are US. Look through them. Join all of them if you want to. I'm sure you could find people breeding there. I mean, you never see nankins for sale anywhere, but the nankin breeder groups are really good about making birds available to people who are really interested in the breed. I did do a Google search. A few breeders came up there. Again, I really feel like that's going to be buyer beware. Check these people out. Get yourself a copy of the Standard of Perfection. Read through it. Make sure what you're buying is a purebred chamo. Right. Because again, they're not widely available. And especially... The dino breeds can be put in the novelty slot and you attract people who are not necessarily chicken people. 
There are people who want to breed an exotic animal and make money. So just look out for that. Now, I do want to mention Jessica because she came out and reached out to us. She wanted to breed Spotlight on the Shamo because she loves them so much. And she sent us pictures. They're absolutely beautiful. Her Instagram account is Keep Cluckin'. And she has some amazing videos and pictures of the Shamo. She makes me laugh so hard. Some of those videos with the Shamos running, it just does me in. I love Her account is fantastic. Go follow her. And she does do conservation breeding of the Shamo, and I believe she has reached out to the Livestock Conservancy, but her information may not be on the breeder list oh, just yet. Right. It might not be there, but it will be updated. They do update that periodically. But Keep Cluckin is on Instagram, and you can get in touch with her over there. And thanks, Jessica, for this awesome request for the Shamo. She also has Russian Orloffs, which just make me droll. They're so beautiful. <laughs> She's so Love sweet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to get to this point. If you do have the Shambo, send us a picture or tag us and mention us in your story and we will reshare the story and share your beautiful Shamos on Instagram. I never thought I would be so into all the dino breeds, but I really like them. They're so cool. They're mm -hmm. so cool. If you're looking for a chicken coop that's produced in a planet-friendly, sustainable way, try Nestera. Each coop is made from highly durable, 100% recycled plastic that keeps the equivalent of up to 2,000 shampoo bottles out of a landfill. Their clean, modern design will fit into any garden or run area and comes with an industry-beating 25-year warranty and a range of handy accessories. Simple to put together, so quick and easy to clean, and most importantly, red mite resistant. Your chickens will love it. Quick shipping from Nestera.us. For a 5% discount, use the affiliate link in our show notes, on our website, and on Instagram. Link in bio. Check them out today. Roosties proudly sponsors Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. We personally use Roosties products with our chickens, and we're huge fans. They have their awesome nesting pads, do-it-yourself feeder and waterer kits, and they've just released their best product ever, a new chick feeder and waterer set. They have adjustable legs to keep food and water clean. They're super well-made, and the feeder even has a removable lid so it can easily be filled from the top. So if you're raising chicks or keeping chickens, all their products are available for prime delivery on Amazon.com. Check out the Roosty store on Amazon or follow the link in our show notes. Let's move on to main topic. Yeah. 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 Now, have you seen the weather lately? I'm trying not to. I know. So between the heat in the Mid-Atlantic, and everything else. We have two potential storms that are coming up the coast. Don't know where they're going. They're tropical depressions, which are looking to turn into this horrible thing called a... Hurricane. Hurricane. And Florida was just recently hit with a hurricane. And that brought us to thinking, maybe we should talk about preparing for these storms and these hurricanes out there because... It's a real deal thing that you need to do with any animal and especially animals who normally live outside. Yeah. When we get into hurricane season, we tend to have a lot of questions from chicken folks who are worried about what to do with their poultry. This year, we've had exponentially more people reaching out because hurricane season is forecast to be pretty bad. It is. So, it is, for sure. And our first suggestion is to start planning ahead of time. You do not want to be surprised by a serious storm that's going to hit the next day and you've got 25 chickens to deal with and nowhere to go. Right. Exactly. Make, make a plan. Have travel carriers and crates. And we talk a lot more about this back in episode 61 with Fiona. We talk about emergency evacuation with poultry. So that might be a, a useful episode to listen to. And what to do if a disaster hits. But today, we're going to zero in on hurricanes and what to do if one is coming. Here's the good thing about hurricanes. We will know about them, like you said, a few days, a week or so in advance so we can start to prep. You can subscribe to get regular updates directly from the National Weather Service or NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association. They both have pretty extensive hurricane coverage. That's not like local news sensationalism. It's like science. <laughs> exactly. So they're going to let you know at least three, four days in advance that Often you may want to start. That, because yeah. they'll track a storm from the time it starts as a tropical depression and forecast its path. Now, sometimes that changes, but it still gives you a good idea of whether or not you need to get yourself in gear. Okay. So the things you want to start preparing for that a hurricane can bring your way are power outages and blocked roads 
flooding and winds. Okay. Those things yep. are going to come with the hurricane. Right. It's not so much just the driving rain. It's everything that goes along with the storm and after. So you really want to make sure you have plenty of extra feed and fresh water on hand in case you can't get out to get them. Clean. We always recommend getting enough feed for at least two, three weeks mm -hmm. before the storm because you never know what will happen to the feed right. store and whether or not you can get it delivered. Clean drinking water is super important for both you and your animals. This is very important. Never let your pets who are mammals come in contact with floodwaters and especially not drink the floodwaters. So I'm going to tell you about this because scientists have been spending a lot of time with this lately. This is a new thing that we need to know about. And birds, just FYI, birds seem to be safe from this bacteria, but humans and other animals aren't. So the University of Maryland and University of Florida recently did a study on floodwaters in Florida. And they found that there were rising rates of flesh-eating bacteria, specifically Vibrio vulnificus. And it's present in brackish floodwaters. In the South, I think that people get regular updates about it because it, it has been a problem in warmer ocean water and in brackish water. It's right. here in the Chesapeake Bay. Like when you hear about somebody who gets like their leg has to be amputated or they lose their life, it's usually right. due to something like this in the water that they come in contact with. Right. As a result of these higher levels of bacteria moving northward, there have been increasing numbers of deaths and loss of limbs from exposure to the bacteria. This is a very good argument against just letting your animals loose and hoping that they survive. I've heard so many people out there that just say, let them go. There's actually rescue teams that come in after and save them. And the thing is, it's so irresponsible to just leave them there to fend for themselves. It's they have They have no recourse to take care of themselves, especially if they're in an enclosure and it floods. Where do they go? And it's just not a responsible thing to do. It's not always that the rescue teams are going to be able to rescue them after. And then with the concerns of flesh-eating bacteria, you don't want to be having to traipse through floodwaters trying to find your birds again. Exactly. The birds themselves. At this point, birds don't seem to be susceptible to the bacteria. The danger would be for you and any other mammals, but you really need to be cognizant of this. And this is interesting. So because chickens don't seem to be responsive to the Vibrio bacteria, Researchers have found if they inoculate hens with an inactive form of Vibrio, after the hens lay, they will check the egg yolks, and the egg yolks have immunoglobulins that help fight Vibrio. Wow. Yeah, I thought that was fascinating. Go yeah. check it. I mean, the best case scenario that we can think of, and the one we know that several of our listeners have enacted, is moving your chickens into a garage, if you have one. Or something that is into your home and into an area that's not going to be flooded. Now, right, into a barn, someplace to keep them out of the storm. Right. If your garage is attached, it keeps everybody out of the storm. You don't even need to go outside. Right. If it's not, at least you're only going from one building to another. Exactly. Now, what I would do here at my house is use my garage. And that would keep them out of the wind, the rain, the other thing in Florida is sometimes people don't have basements in other areas when it's low lying and you get flooding, you don't have a basement. So that's why we say carriers and pop ups to move them in for a day or two until you can get them back out and out of flooding. Or if you have a basement that would flood, that would be just as bad. Yeah. Exactly. And generally, garages do pretty well. But again, if you're in a flood area, you all need to be in the same area so they're just as safe as you are. And I mean, having honestly, having pop-ups and carriers on hand is so important. Honestly, if you're just trying to ride out a hurricane, worst case scenario, maybe you can just put your chickens in the bathroom. Exactly. Put some newspaper down. I mean, get creative. If it's in the bathtub, keeping you and your birds safe, figure out what you can do. Do you have a pantry? Do you have a mud room would be ideal if you're lucky enough to have one. Any of these things. Exactly. And that's why we say start keeping these things on hand if you're in these areas. Getting maybe one or two a year a pop-up if you have a larger flock so that you can put them in there and can find them and put food and water in there and keep them safe. Going to the thrift store. Thrift stores always have carriers. Trust me, I'm always in a thrift store. They always have animal carriers that someone's giving up. 
snatching those up so that you have a place to keep them confined and safe. Right. Carriers and crates are a really good idea. Yard sales are another good place. Oh, yeah. Now, if you're in a higher elevation area and you have no bodies of water around you that can flood, you may choose to weather the storm at home. You can still get a lot of rain. You can still get dangerous hurricane force winds. So you want to make sure your coops and shelters are tied down if they're in a place with no wind block or no protection from high winds. Right. Tie down kits are easy to find. You can get them at hardware stores. You can get them at Lowe's, Home Depot, even on Amazon. You also want to secure anything that could blow into your coops or into your chickens. Right. So if you choose to keep your chickens in their coops during the storm and you have a very strong coop, there are still things you need to do out there. You know, I always say, number one, if you can bring them in, bring them in. If not, if they're in the coop and they're not in a flood area, like Holly Ann said, make sure you're securing that coop because winds of 100 plus are going to be able to move a coop. If it's not something like an Amish built coop or something like that, they're going to be able to move these coops. Right. And trees falling, everything else could fall on the coops or your home, too. So everyone needs to be in a safe environment. I mean... I think that I wouldn't chance this, but I would think that our big Amish coops could withstand limbs and things coming down. I've seen them. Um, well, we know mine withstood an entire tree. My so. sister's Amish coop on the family farm, when we had that little tornado come through last month, a tree did come down on her Amish coop. It's got some damage to the roof, but that's it. Yeah. Thing is built like a brick house. I mean, when they weigh in, usually between 800 and 1,000 pounds, the Amish mm-hmm. coops. So they know that they have some staying power. But where I was going with that is my plastic coops, I would probably not leave a chicken in a plastic coop during a hurricane. Here's just, the other that's thing. That's just me. That's just me. You, you know, your mileage may vary. Here's the thing I love. Let's look at Nastera. Nastera's coops are so easy to take apart and put back together. You could even move that coop into your garage. You could. And put your chickens in there safely Mm -hmm. and keep them contained and keep the mess in there. That's what I like about those. They're easy to move, put together, take apart, and they're really nice. I like that idea. If you don't want any mess at all, bring the coop indoors. Right. To the garage or the basement and put them all in there. So that's a really good thing. Water. We talked about always having fresh water. Start the few days that you know the storm's coming. Save your gallon containers. Don't recycle them. Save them so that you have at least a week's worth of gallon containers and start filling them when you know it's going to hit. So if you lose power and you lose your well or you lose water, you have water for you and the animals. If you live in a coastal area that has flooded before during hurricanes, or if you've ever been under direct evacuation orders, it's probably time for you to make plans. There are emergency shelters that allow pets, and we have linked a few of these guides in the show notes, but with multiple birds, your best bet may be to find a friend or a family that has safe space to keep you and your flock for a while. Like your sister in the next state is on the side of the hill and she's got an empty barn. Maybe she'll let you guys go and stay with her. And that's why we say pop-ups. They fold flat and you can put like 20 of them in your car if you had to. Pop-ups are a really good thing for evacuations and having to leave an area. Right. Ready.gov and PetsWelcome.com are two pretty helpful sites. Oh, yeah. You can also check out your own county's website. Many of the southern counties have evacuation and emergency shelter information available. And you can just call your local shelter and see like, can I bring my four pet chickens? Or, you know, do I have to make other plans? These are things that you really want to be aware of. Right, exactly. So, you know, hurricanes are nothing to play around with. They go from category one to category five. Depending upon what it is, your provisions are going to change a little bit. Depending upon if you're in a flood area or in a higher elevation, that's going to change a little bit. But definitely start planning when, you know, a few days out, Now, food, water, provisions, shelter, keep safe. And if you have any questions or concerns, you can always message us and we will help you to the best of our ability. I mean, where we come down on this is better safe than sorry. Always. And these are all the things that we do ourselves because we are actually in a hurricane area ourselves. So 
Check hey. out our show notes. I will put all of the hurricane resources we can find on there. And if you have any good ideas, shoot them our way and we'll share them with everyone. Definitely. Okay. So let's move on to cracking the eggs. Cracking those eggs. Now, this week's cracking the eggs is a little recipe that my hubby came up with, Joe. And they're named Joe's Shrimp Burgers with Avocado Old Bay Sauce. Yum, yum, yum. It's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good. Oh, yeah. Now, these shrimp burgers are awesome if you have a friend who's gluten, dairy-free, and you need to use a recipe for them, something really good to eat. Yeah. So we call for breadcrumbs or cracker meal, and you can easily get either one of those gluten-free now. It's very simple. Yeah. And I love the fact that Joe, I mean, sometimes he makes them gluten-free for us, but you know, Ritz crackers are kind of buttery and add a little bit of that fat into the burger and you can mm -hmm. use that to kind of make it fatter. Yeah. Really any kind of a like a bready binder, whether it's cracker meal or breadcrumbs, it works. So oh. your your bases are covered. Okay. So you tell us about the shrimp burgers. What are we going to put in this? Well, I will say this because I'm lazy. I make the avocado sauce before the shrimp burgers because I don't want to have to wash my food processor out completely. So you want me to talk first? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah. Do you tell us about the avocado sauce? So let's start with the avocado sauce because Holly Ann likes to make this, like she said, ahead of time and put it in the fridge. So one ripe avocado, make sure it's ripe, not too ripe. A handful of cilantro, well rinsed and coarsely chopped or cut with your little herb scissors. I have those. I use those. Two tablespoons of lime juice, salt and pepper to taste. Old Bay, and two tablespoons of mayonnaise. The Old Bay, I usually do like half a teaspoon because I just like a bit. You can go up to two teaspoons or more if you want. We're going more in the DiCarlo house and you know it. So we're going to put that more in there. You're going to take all of those ingredients, put them in a food processor, and you're going to puree it until it's smooth. I love this. So the magic ingredient is at Old Bay along with the mayo and the avocado. It's going to be so creamy. And once you do that, you're going to puree it till it's smooth. And then you're going to cover and you're going to put it in the fridge until you need it. So that's the first thing you're going to do. Yeah, just use a spatula, scrape it out, put it in a bowl, rinse out the food processor very well and continue on my way. So the shrimp burgers. For the shrimp burgers, you're going to need a pound of shrimp peeled and deveined. It doesn't matter what size shrimp you use because you're going to chop them up. Chop them up. up. Yeah. You want one small onion roughly chopped. Don't go crazy with it because it's going in the food processor. One small zucchini. You want it small because you want it really tender. Finely grated. You're going to squeeze out all the moisture that you can. You want about a tablespoon of fresh herbs of your choice. Parsley and marjoram are my favorites, but you can do dill, oregano, thyme, whatever you want. A tablespoon of lemon juice. One large egg, lightly beaten, and about a half a cup of breadcrumbs or cracker meal. And we use Ritz crackers over here. I just use gluten-free breadcrumbs. Whatever you find, if you're gluten-free, whatever will work. You could probably even try cornmeal. I don't know. Yeah. Might work. So the egg is going to work as a binder and keep everything together. You're going to put the shrimp and the onion in the food processor, and you're going to pulse it like three or four times to start roughly chopping it. Don't make it into paste. You want to keep it chunky. Throw your herbs in there and pulse a few more times to blend it a little more. When there's still some chunks left, you're going to empty that into like a medium-sized bowl. You're going to add that shredded zucchini, the lemon juice, the beaten egg, and the breadcrumbs, and roughly mix everything together. You don't need to overmix it. Just get it pretty well blended. When it looks like it's mostly combined, you're going to form it into four or five patties. You don't want them super thick because you want them to cook through. This is right. not cooked. And once you have the patties made, I just put them on a pan with wax paper, pop them in the refrigerator for about an hour or so, and that lets the egg and the breadcrumbs start working together to form the binding. Right. When you're ready, you can grill, fry, or even bake these burgers. I pan fried them on medium-low heat. It was about four to five minutes per side, and they were ridiculously good. And Joe uses, of course, the grill, and right? He grills them. So you're going to do the same depending upon your heat on the grill to get them to grill through. Whatever you do, I would suggest spraying pretty well or oh, oiling yeah. pretty well because, you know, they can get sticky. 
but they're, again, they're delicious. Oh, you know what just popped into my head? What's that? What if you went with some lemon herbs, like a little lemongrass or something in the shrimp? Exactly. You, know, you can even get bit. like lemon basil now. You can get yeah. a lot of different mixtures that you can toss that in. And I love this because this is usually one that most people will eat. Right. Now you can either serve it on a bun, a gluten-free bun, a lettuce bun, any kind of thing that you want to do and serve it with a nice potato salad or something when you have company over or just for a dinner that you want to put out on the grill. You could serve it on a bed of greens. You, when you have your best, versatile. Yeah, when you have your bestie over to talk chickens. Anything that you want to do, it's great. So try it. You might like it. Send us pictures. We want to see. Thanks, honey. That's for Joe. He gave us the recipe this week. Okay, so let's move on to how to say it. Retail therapy. Retail therapy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, this week's retail therapy, we are talking a book or a series of books that we love, love, love. Right, It's a two-volume set that recently was reprinted. For a long time, there was an original version of this book that was selling for crazy amounts of money. And this is The Glass Hen on a Nest Dish Value Guide. Now, when you say crazy amounts of money, you're talking hundreds of dollars. Yeah, hundreds like, of dollars. This book was being sold for like 300 plus dollars oh, for the book. I saw this as high as $700, believe it or not. It was crazy. $300 was on the cheap side. And originally, people could buy this book for like 25 or 30 or 40 bucks. So, so this, supply and demand. Right. In December of last year, however, as I was poking around on eBay... I came across this book. It has been republished by the West Virginia Glass Museum. They've done it in a two-volume set. It is very thorough. It is an amazing resource if you collect hens on nest dishes. And it's $50. And I got it for Christmas from Holly Ann. So we (laughs) both have it. it. I got it for Christmas from Holly Ann, too. (laughs) So we both own it because you know we're crazy about hens on nests. And it's a great reference book to have, especially if you're out in the stores and you get one and you want to look it up and you can't find it online. These books are amazing. I just put them next to my chair sometimes at night when I want to just unwind and look at the hens on the nest and look at the pretty ones. And it tells you where they're from. One has Europe. One has the United States with the makers of the hens on nests. So they're really cool books. And the pictures are amazing. And it shows you how many are out there that you can actually get. That's what I use it for inspiration. So I can keep my eyes open. Oh, yeah, definitely. I love looking at mine. Look at that one. That one's amazing. I'm going to keep my eye open for that on eBay and in the in the Honestly, wild. Every now and again, I find a hen on a nest in the, in the thrift shop, but I feel like I find them more at antique shops. Oh, yeah. But you know what? I have to put this week my Avon hen on a nest up. I have yeah. yet to do that. But that was found in a thrift store in the wild. Right. And it's amazing. And I love it. So, you know, we collect these and This book is just so much fun to look at. We'll have it up on our Amazon storefront. Or wait, we can't have it up on our Amazon storefront. No, I'll just link to it on eBay. We'll link to it on eBay on our show notes. Take a look at it. You might love it. If you love to collect hens on Nest, that's what you need to do. Okay, so should we tell everybody what we're going to be talking about next week? (laughs) Yes, we should. Next week, we are spotlighting an Old school hybrid. And this is for one of our amazing listeners and patrons. Tashina. Tashina. Tashina, we're going to do the Austra White just for you. Main topic, we're talking about the truth about natural dewormers. Yes. The truth about natural dewormers and chemical dewormers. And we're going to get into all of that. Cracking the eggs. We're doing a delicious late summer mixed berry trifle. Yummy. Very late summer because this is just about the start of fall. Retail therapy, we are visiting an Etsy shop from one of our listeners. The shop is Farm Happy, and we're going to talk about some amazing chicken tote bags. They're so cute. Okay, so what should we tell everybody to do until next week? Hug your chickens. Every day and kiss them too. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. If you'd like to see more of us, please follow us on Instagram at Coffee with the Chicken Ladies. If you'd like to help us grow the podcast, please leave us a written review on Apple Podcasts. 
If you'd like to become a patron of the show, please visit our Patreon page, patreon.com slash coffee with the chicken ladies. Thanks for listening. Ha, 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 ha.